Welcome to this Creative Assembly live stream. My name's Joy and I'll be live in the chat throughout today's stream, so please ask questions as we go. I'm going to share with you all today how we made a tutorial for Total War of Warhammer 3, where 49% of players completed the optional tutorial. First though, a quick bit about myself. My name is Joy Day and I am born and raised in Sweden, which is what the accent is if you're wondering. I am a lead designer at Creative Assembly, I am an ambassador for women in games and a champion for diversity champions. I have been in the industry for a bit over 14 years now and I have worked in different roles such as QA, build engineering and design and also worked in a bunch of different companies like EA, Microsoft and Headstrong Games. And I have now been with Creative Assembly for almost seven years, so half my career actually. Before we get into the details, let's cover what I hope you'll take, take away from this session. This session isn't about Total War, but I'll use uh, the recent work Total War Warhammer 3 to demonstrate our approach and what we learned. It's not about tutorials as such, it's about onboarding players into sometimes complex game systems. I want to show you how and why you should keep it simple, the importance of testing at every step and how and why you can make sure voices are heard. The latest release title I worked on at CA was Total War Warhammer 3 and specifically the prologue campaign, which is a tutorial campaign. Tutorials are difficult to do because we're all experts of our own games and we have to put ourselves in a position of a new player and try and design the experience for them. The challenge is to keep it simple but engaging, which is something that applies to many games, if not all. We all have different goals with our tutorials depending on the genre, scope, budget and a bunch of other things. But one thing we all have in common is to teach players how to play our game. I said this talk wasn't about Total War, it's not, but having an understanding of the complex design helps to illustrate the journey we went on. So, what is Total War? Total War is an empire simulation with two unique layers, a campaign layer, which is the turn-based strategy part of the game, and a battle layer, where you control large-scale armies in real-time battles. The Total War games have a lot of depth, and that's what makes them so compelling. But with that depth comes a lot of complexity, and that's why it's difficult for new players to learn the game. I will just show a quick video so you can get an idea of what the game is like. Immerse yourself in a vast, fantastical world of vivid landscapes and terrifying beasts. Engage in statecraft, diplomacy, exploration, and grow your empire turn by turn. Capture, build, and manage teeming settlements, and recruit vast armies. When we were coming to the third game of the trilogy, we thought this would be a good time to do a tutorial. We knew we needed to make a good tutorial, as the game itself would naturally attract new players. We already had a growing player base from Warhammer 2 and knew this game would attract a lot of interest, so we wanted the best possible way to onboard people. All these new people, new players that we hoped to come in, we needed a way to get them up to speed. Total War can be unforgiving. One of the main reasons people have struggled with our games is because there's so many things on the screen at the same time. People get overwhelmed. Being dropped in the middle of a sandbox area makes it difficult to know where to start, especially if you're a new player. Keeping players for longer than a certain amount of turns can be a problem. So we asked ourselves, how do we onboard people without them bouncing off? We had onboarding in the previous Warhammer titles that received mixed reviews. In Warhammer 1 we threw the players straight into the battle because we thought we would do it the Hollywood way, put people straight into the action and they would be immersed. But in reality, it made people feel disoriented and not knowing what was going on. In Warhammer 2, we had a structured 5 to 10 turns for each race, where you played different battles and learned a new thing in each. And it was quite successful. But in the third title, the game director wanted something different and to start fresh and try and tackle some of the legacy issues from previous games. Features that new players have struggled with while existing Total War fans are already familiar with. So 
we decided to go back to basics. So how do we teach something so complex to new players? Easy, we keep it simple. We started with the mission statement. So we would all know what the vision of this project was. Our mission statement was, the intention of the prologue is to have a cut-down version of the Total War game to make it easier for new players to learn the game. It has limited UI and limited features, but is more narrative driven, very polished and is highly UX tested. The players should be able to feel like they have learned the basics of a Total War game and should not feel as overwhelmed when they start a new campaign in Warhammer 3. But let's get into the solutions in more detail. For some of you, this will be reminders, but hopefully I can share some ideas of how to take them further. Let's have a look at the features. We had to determine what features would be included in this mini campaign, as it would be too long and complicated to teach all the possible features. We had to go back to basics and think about what are the key features of a Total War game? What features can be removed and make it still feel like a Total War game? And also, at the same time, make the game feel engaging. Because, let's face it, some tutorials can be quite boring. Especially if it's heavily focused on text. Uh, and with a game like Total War, it's really difficult to teach without using text. So, what did we do to try and make it not boring and not too overwhelming? The approach we took for the prologue was trying to spread out the learning between the different turns and simplify features wherever possible. For example, instead of giving the player the full set of options within a feature, we would limit it to a few options so when they go on to play the main campaign, they will find some things that they are familiar with from the tutorial campaign and then hopefully experiment on their own with the rest. We also took the UI gating approach. At each turn, we looked at what information do they actually need at this point of the game. Not everything in a feature has to be available in one go. This is why the first shot of the campaign after the cutscene looks like this. There is minimal UI and the character is in the center of the screen. Simple. Compared to the main campaign, where it looks more like this, if you remember. The ne next set of actions are broken down into really tiny tasks and they are displayed in a way to try and make sure the player won't miss it and know exactly what to do in this given moment. As the players learn a new feature, a new UI element appears on the screen. Every time a new feature or button is unlocked, we darken the screen and point to the new UI element like this. The idea is that the player should focus on this new thing and also use it straight away. So, having it like this, they can only press the missions button. Another method we are using in the prologue to try and teach the player about the different features and panels, we have added something called a guided tour for the players that don't mind reading. When pressing this information button in the top right corner of the panel, the player opts in to these tours and it gives them additional information on how the panel works or what, inf uh, or what information the player can find here which is not always crucial to know to play the game, but can be useful when you want to play more strategically. The reason we made these optional is because feedback we got from testing the prologue was that players don't read the text on screen. Which takes us into the next solution, which is the text. When teaching something, try and keep it as short and condensed as possible. We can always go into more complex strategies or mechanics later on if needed, look at what does the player actually need to know right now and have optional ways of learning more through text for the players that prefer to learn that way. We also have a problem with trying to describe a simple action in text form. So if we take constructing a building, for example, in text form, the instructions will be left click on the settlement to open the settlement panel click on an available slot, then left click on the building you want to construct. It's a bit long-winded and I lost interest as I was reading this out loud, so we used video tutorials where we could. This probably doesn't come as a surprise for anyone that a short video can teach someone a simple action in a much quicker way. 
And time matters in a tutorial, because the player just wants to get on with things as quickly as possible, which is why these videos were crucial. Not only do they teach something quickly, but it also reduces the amount of text the player needs to read in what is already a very text-heavy game. I really wanted to try and avoid arrows and highlights because I was quite adamant that they ruined the immersion, but after all the playtesting, it was quite clear that the player felt lost. So we added them, and it made a difference to how quickly the players were progressing in the game. Instead of being stuck with a simple task, they can now just get on with the game and not feel as frustrated. So I had to admit I was wrong. Although, we didn't need them everywhere. We started off by not having them and just added them according to where players were struggling in the playtests. The next thing we do is to give them a story goal. It gives the player a meaning to the action they are doing at or learning at the time. We use breadcrumbing to give the players little story rewards as they are learning a new mechanic. In a big sandbox game, these story drops are usually far apart, but in this tutorial we have them in almost every turn, at least in the beginning. The narrative is a big part of the prologue, if not the key motivational part of it. It's not enough just to make a tutorial that only teaches the player the game. The tutorial needs other things that make the game engaging and making actions memorable, which a story can help with. In our tutorial, the player takes the role of Prince Yuri of, on of the Ongol tribe, a brave champion of Kislev who is sent into the north, the Chaos Wastes, in search of Urson, the bear god of Kislev, whose roar of spring hasn't been heard in decades, and so the motherland suffers. The expedition is long and takes its toll, but just as the Kislevites think about turning back south, Urson answers Yuri's prayers. Emboldened, they make their way to Dervingard, the furthest Kislevite stronghold in the northern wastes. Beyond Dervingard, Yuri continues his search, facing foes and making unlikely allies in his obsession to find the lost god. Eventually, he comes to the Howling Citadel, where the one who has entrapped the bear god reveals himself and gives Yuri a choice that will shape the world. We needed the player to care about Yuri, so they would want to go on this journey with him and want to see what is next, to keep the player wanting to keep playing. And how do we do that? We create interesting characters. Yuri has a brother called Garrick, who also serves as an advisor. And we use voiceover dialogue to have the player understand the dynamic between the brothers and make the story come alive a bit more. And even use VO in other areas of the campaign to portray the story wherever we could, like the loading screens or missions, which are normally not VO'd. The VO was also t used to reinforce the learning, especially in the tutorial battles, where the player is shown the immediate task, but since the battle is in real time and the player has to react within a certain time limit, the player has to... Uh, having Garrick saying things out loud helps players focusing on the battle without having to dis be distracted by the text. But the text is still there in case they aren't sure what they need to do or if they need a reminder and for accessibility reasons the VO should always be accompanied by with text. But for some players adding VO means less text for them to read. One of the hardest things for the writers was combining the learning with the story. So the gameplay decisions had to make sense for someone who is lost in the mountains in the north. The first thing you would want to do is to make a camp, which is what Yuri does after learning the basic controls. But this had to continue throughout the whole campaign. So we sat down and worked on this together, where I would show the order, the features are unlocked, and the writers had to try and find a motivation for Yuri. And if it didn't make sense story-wise, then we could change some of the feature unlock order as well. This was very important to make the story immerse, uh, make sense and keep the player immersed. The area we create for the player plays a huge part in this. In our case, it was the campaign map. It had to be designed in a way where the shape made sense. The player should never feel lost and the goals should be clear. We wanted to capture the sandbox nature of the game, but also we needed a clear structure so everyone would learn the things in the same order. So the map changed from this shape 
to this shape. Where the first drafts, drafts of the map tried to capture the sandbox feeling of a Total War campaign, but it made it difficult to teach the players things in a certain order, because they could be going anywhere. After several iterations of the map, we ended up with this version, where the player starts in the south and the goal is in the north, to make it very simple to understand. At the beginning, the campaign is quite a linear experience, with the intention of teaching the player the basics of Total War. They can focus on only learning the basics without having to also understand where they are on the map. And once they get to a point where we feel we can loosen the reins a bit, the map opens up and the player can put their knowledge to test. And then the map expands even more to try and create the sandbox experience. It's important for the player to know what their goal is, so having the next goal always be north makes it clear where the ultimate goal is. At the top. They know where they need to go without any confusion. This is how the tutorial balloon was born. In our case, it has taken the shape of a literal balloon, but the concept probably applies to many games. The tutorial is the balloon, and at the start where the string is, basically the hand-holding part of the game, and they get detailed instructions on what to do, and the actual balloon is the sandbox area in our case. And it's where the game lets go of their hand and they get to experiment on their own in a safe and restricted environment and make some gameplay decisions. In this case, whether they want to progress the story or explore the map more. The player should feel immersed while learning. The visual themes throughout the map had to make sense for the story. We are introducing a few new races from the main campaign, so the area they are in on the map will influence that as well. As you can see, with the Zinchar, one of the Chaos God races, who are all about change and manipulation, have an area with lots of crystal and weirdness. And with the Corner, another Chaos God race, it's all about the fire and blood. We disabled the ability to rotate the camera, the result of another idea of how to keep it simple. This helped the environment artists too, when creating the assets for the map, as the players would only be able to see them from one angle. Not only was the visual aspects of the map considered for the immersion, but the sound design as well, where the sound is different depending on the area of the map you are, and will also reflect the progression in the story. A player's experience starts when they are booting the game. What's the first thing the player is met with? What happens the first time a new player boots the game? Let's assume they want to learn how to play your game. How easy is it for them to find the tutorial? Make it simple and obvious of where it is located in the front end, especially if it's separate from the main game. When a player starts Total War Warhammer 3 for the first time, they are met with this box. We encourage new players to play the tutorial right here. And for returning players, they can either choose to play the tutorial, for the story in our case, or they can choose to go straight to the main menu. But it wasn't enough to just design these things and implement them we have to test them, test them as well. It's important. No matter how sure I think I am about a theory, I need some data to back that up. It's really easy to become blind to the little things when you look at something every day. I tried to prologue on some people at work who hasn't played the game before and tried to catch issues early on and discovered that the terminology has become second nature to me, but doesn't mean anything to other people. One person had a task on screen to occupy the settlement and walked around the whole map. And when I asked why they didn't just take the settlement, they said that they didn't know what a settlement was. So I changed the word in the task to match the name of the settlement instead. And that way the player will be able to reference the word on the task with a word they see on the screen. We have an in-house UX research team. And they carried out a few playtests with external people who haven't played a Total War game before or have very limited experience with it, so we could get an understanding of how the target audience would approach the campaign. We had a few usability tests where the researchers observed players fully and obtained detailed feedback on their understanding of game mechanics, controls, UI or lack thereof, essentially helping us understand where the players might struggle in the game 
And we will get feedback like being able to lose Yuri on the map, not understanding how different features work and not knowing what the controls are. Some examples that came out of these usability tests are things blending into the environment, art assets were difficult to see, like in the top left GIF, and the players that could see it tried to interact with it and noticed that it didn't work, which made the players think that the marker in the bottom left GIF was a cosmetic feature as well, when in reality it's the marker that shows the next location the player has to go to. And you can see what we changed it to on the right, based on the feedback we received. The environment art asset is more visible and is outside the playable area, so the player can't try and interact with it. And the quest marker stands out more, and we made a cutscene that points out that it's the next location the player should go to. Things like these may seem obvious to people working on the game, but are crucial to people who have never seen this game before. We were able to catch a lot of these things because of the usability tests. We also carried out a few experience tests or sentiment tests where the researchers obtained feedback from players on how much they enjoy the game, whether the experience players have match the intended experience we wanted to create. And this is where we could see if the story made sense to the player, what the players thought about Yuri and his brother, and if those were the intended impressions and whether we needed to make any story amendments or reinforce it somewhere which we actually had to do based on the feedback. For example, players didn't understand why they were going north, so we had to emphasize the goals a lot more. It was important to me to include people from dis different disciplines in the team to play the game together so we could create the best experience possible for the player. Before the pandemic, when we were all in the office, I would gather people in front of a big screen so we could play through the campaign together and stop at certain points so we could brainstorm what could be done to make a song and dance about different things. These ideas could come from anywhere and anyone and since the expert in the area was there, they could immediately tell us if I the idea was possible or not or what kind of support was needed to make it happen. Since this was an experiment, in a way, most of us were in the same mindset to try something new. So instead of going, no, it can't be done straight away, some ideas were actually given a chance. Not only did we manage to create a new and interesting things with this new approach, but also we created a great team dynamic from trying to solve a problem together. This project was a bit of an experiment since we haven't done anything like this before. It was important to make sure that people felt like they could speak out because we needed new ideas and opinions on the new onboarding designs from as many people as possible since we couldn't just rely on previous experience. This is important even if your product isn't an experiment or if it's number 15 of a game series, you want everyone to feel included. So we had to make sure people felt heard. There were a few things that really helped achieving this in our case. One thing that helped was keeping the group small during group playthroughs. It was important so everyone could be heard. These sessions were only an hour or an hour and a half long and we went back and forth in discussions a lot. So keeping the group small made it possible to hear from everyone. I have to admit, when I first joined the team, I felt out of place. I didn't feel like I would be heard. Who would want to listen to me? For as long as I can remember, I have always struggled to speak up about things. It started at home, where I wasn't allowed to question anything my parents said. It made me a very quiet but observant child, and that combined with looking different made me a target for bullying. I wouldn't raise my hand to answer questions at school because I didn't want any attention. It was better if the other kids forgot I was there. I was terrible at presentations because, again, everyone would look at me and that made me really nervous. It still does, in a way. And as an adult, there have been situations where I should have spoken up, but I felt like I couldn't. These are just some examples of why it's difficult for me to speak up. And there could be plenty of other reasons why it's difficult for other people. But what helped me to come out of my shell was therapy and having people that cared about me. But having a lead who supported me, who believed in me, helped massively. 
I can't stress enough how important the lead is when it comes to listening and feeling heard. My lead was, and still is, very good with making sure that people who aren't as outspoken as others gets a chance to talk too. Because the group was so close, it made it possible to interrupt the ones that could dominate the conversation without them feeling bad and to give an opening for the ones to struggle to find a gap to share their opinion in the discussions. My lead created an environment that made me feel safe and I was able to take part in the discussions. After a while, I felt comfortable enough to join in on the discussions without waiting for him to create that space for me. If it wasn't for him, I would probably not be recording this right now. <laughs> um, he should be doing a talk about how to create that kind of environment because I think everyone could benefit from that. For example, it happened at Nintendo, where it started with one person. That's right, I am talking about Gunpei Yokoi. He was the creator of the Game & Watch handheld system and the inventor of the D-pad in controllers. He ended up being the head of the first research and development team at Nintendo. And to get the other engineers to share their ideas, he would share some of his own crazy ideas out loud. And when people could see that it worked, then they wouldn't be afraid to share theirs. This philosophy still lives on at Nintendo and is the reason we have seen such diverse consoles from Nintendo, like the Wii and the Switch. That kind of environment didn't only help with sharing ideas, it also made them start thinking more outside the box. And that's something that applies in design as well. Creating an environment where people feel safe will make them more creative as well. And working with people from different backgrounds and who have had different experiences will most likely put very creative ideas on the table and generate really useful feedback as well. This is why it's so important to have a diverse team. The combination of our ideas ended up being the best ideas. Some of the best ideas came out of the play sessions for us and they were usually a mix of different people's ideas but merged into what would work best in the game. This is why it's so important to create the space and environment for people to feel comfortable sharing their views in a form of communication that works for them. Group setting is what worked for us, but they are not for everyone. But sharing ideas can be done in many different ways. For example, through one-on-one -on -one meet meetings, a mirror board online, or even using post-it notes on a board. Be creative about the different means of communication. So, what are the next steps for us? According to comments I've seen online, the prologue campaign seems quite successful and people enjoyed the experience. There are some things we could have done better though, apart from the things that I think we all want, more time and resources. I'm hoping to be able to improve a few things if we do anything like this again in the future. I would like to use even less text to teach things in a strategy game like ours. We could have more text being read out or use short videos more. I would like to have more accessibility options so more people can enjoy the experience. We could include people from even more teams to our playthroughs, playthrough feedback sessions. Or instead of having the same group of people, we could have some seats be rotating. So uh, the group is still quite small, but more diverse. We could have several tutorials where more complicated mechanics are taught and keep them all optional, of course. So we have reached the end of the talk, but I just want to recap what I've gone through. Make your tutorial as simple as possible. Figure out what key components are needed to make your game feel like your game. Simplify those things as much as you can when you teach the player what they are. Use as little text as possible. Only add the information that is necessary in that given moment. You can always expand on it later or use an optional way for the player to read about it. Just learning isn't always motivation enough for players, so add a story to give the player an extra motivation and give them a reason of why they are doing what they are doing. Make sure you test the tutorial as much as you can, both internally and, if possible, externally. Get members of your team to test it and give feedback. Make sure to use different ways of giving feedback. Some people might prefer to do it in a group and others might want to play it through themselves and send your written feedback. If you have access and resources, 
Then use UX tests to test your theories and check if the experience players have is the intended one. Take the report back to the team and find solutions for the problems together. And finally, make sure you include everyone and that everyone feels heard. Create a space where people feel comfortable and where they can feel like they can speak out. Make sure everyone gets heard by listening and taking action if there are problems or suggestions. Create a team feeling by solving problems and by playing the game together. Thank you for joining this Creative Assembly live stream. Keep an eye on our YouTube channel for more content.